Ben Kirchival, I hope you're doing well. Ben, welcome into the game here in Tuscaloosa. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, looking forward to the conversation, you've got an article here that really grabbed our attention and uh, wanted to dive a little deeper into it. And uh, you've got five bold predictions. And your number three is Tua Tonga Vailoa will become a steady part of Alabama's offense uh, in 2017. Let's talk about it. Well, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a tough call because this is Jalen's team. Right, and, and I think the first thing that's noteworthy about this is this is not an anticipation of a quarterback controversy. Uh, Jalen regressed a, a little bit at the end of last year, but he, he's the reigning SEC Offensive Player of the Year. It's not like he's a nobody. He, he's a very good player, and as a sophomore, you hope that he takes that next step forward in, in his development. But everything that I've gathered from, from Tua is that not only is he a tremendous talent, but he embraces competition. And I think in this day and age of, of quarterback play, where there are transfers all the time, that he's coming into this situation where he knows this is Jalen's team and he's got to go and earn any little bit of, of playing time that he might receive, and it's not even guaranteed that he'd receive it. I think that says a lot about his competitive nature as well. And so I, I think he has the, the mental makeup along with the physical makeup. I think what now if, if Wayne Kiffin was still the offense coordinator, I think this is a slam dunk because I think he would just throw two out on the field and go, just go make a play, like, and I'll I'll take the heat for it later. But I, I think what what Jalen Hurts really showed Nick Saban last year is that if you have tremendous skill at the most important position or at least the most recognized position in in football, it's really tough to just keep that on the sideline. So the the challenge for Nick Saban then becomes, because he's done the two quarterback thing before, but it's just how do you keep the locker room together? How do you keep the chemistry together? How do you keep the egos in check? And there's a lot of balance, especially with two young guys, that you would have to do. But if he goes out and, and as a freshman shows that he has some skill to get yards, get points, and, and really brings an extra level to that offense, I think – the fact that this offense is now in the 21st century with, with a true dual threat back there behind center, I, I think it absolutely behooves Saban to find situations to put him in that also don't compromise the overall integrity of the offense. Well, Ben, you're not going to get the argument from me uh, because I've been one of those guys when I first watched Tua Tungvaloa show up on campus. Uh, I said, this guy's elite. Uh, I don't think, and this is my opinion, and you can disagree with me if you'd like, I think Jalen Hurts is a dynamic quarterback. I don't think he can be an elite passer. I think what we are talking with, with Tua Tungvaloa, I think he can transform the position in Tuscaloosa when you look at the quarterback position. Uh, I think it, it's a bold prediction, but – you got to also factor a lot of this in. If Jalen Hurts makes it through this year without Tua Tungabailoa breaking in that playing time, what's to say he's going to sit here and wait for three years on it? I, well, I think that's, that's the debate. A, well, that's why it's a it's a bold prediction is that he has to fight off the 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 incumbent to even get onto the field. Now, you, you mentioned Hurts as a, as a passer. I, I would. I'd agree with you kind of in, in principle on that, as I think Kurt has some room to grow in that regard. He was, a, he was a true freshman last year. Like, at some point, you have to go, okay, just take a step back. He's a true freshman. He has some ways to go, you know, as, as far as him developing into a more complete player. And you have to allow him the time to do that. If look, and, I, and I can't really say much for Tua because all I've seen really is a spring game, and I'm not really going to – I'm not going to go all in just – based on on that but oh come on ben I, ben you, you sure you don't want to go all in with me man I'm, i've been on this island for like <laughs> three months by myself i mean i'm looking for company are you well you know you, you'll just you'll 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 be fine there. you'll be fine there <laughs> i'm just yourself. aggravating you but uh it's uh yeah so as far as him if he doesn't if he doesn't beat out I, let me let me rephrase that if he doesn't it break into some playing time as a freshman I, i'd give it another year or so but you typically need to see that jump by year two or year three. And, and if we're not seeing them, then, then yeah, I, I think obviously it's a different story. Yeah, and, and I think um, when you look at you know Lane Kiffin, uh, and I appreciate the little plug in, in the article, when you look at Lane Kiffin that was part of our program 
uh, about a month ago. I, I put him on the spot because he's the one that hand selected to Atanga Valoa uh, to come and be a part of you know Alabama's offense. And uh, I asked him point blank. I said, you know, knowing Jalen's skill set, do you expect him to play? And and he said, I don't think you can keep him off the field. And and I I've, I've never said that he's going to to be the starting quarterback over Jalen Hurts. I just said. I'm I'm sort of like you. I, I don't know how you can keep this guy off the field. And, and I think well, Nick Saban. We also we also know that Lane Kiffin loves Ferrari, right? He loves toys. Sure he does. Yeah, it, it, Lane Kiffin is a guy who want like he is, and this is what he never got enough credit for. I don't think because I think so many people were had their glasses on about him in every other aspect of of his life and in football. He's an unbelievable play caller for matchups. And if you give him the right guys, he's going to crush you in a bunch of different ways. So if Wayne Kiffin says, I'm going to, I believe him wholeheartedly when he says, I got to find a way to get two onto the field. Just because it, it just, it, it, it gets his creative juices flowing. So Nick's cut from a different cloth. You know, it, it, and he's been pretty hard about, doing things a certain way for, for such a long time. But like I said, I think you go back to last year, and he in that first game against USC, he's like, all right, let's, let's give Jalen a, a, a chance. And he, and he fumbles right away, but then he comes back out, and he starts making great plays. And I, I tell you, Nick Saban, for as much as a process guy as he is, I think that was a moment of reinvention for him. And I think he's a reinvented coach, which is why I'm, I'm in on to getting some playing time this year. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, let, let me also ask you about this. How much, and, and I'm, I'm just tying the bold prediction into a question, when you look at right. the style of offense that Alabama is going to be running, because the indication is that they're going to go a little bit more back to a pro-style system uh, with Brian Dable coming in from New England. If you look at the way they, they run a lot of their offense, it's based on a lot of timing. And I think that's where Tua has the advantage over Jalen when you talk about throwing those, you know, anticipating where a wide receiver is going to be rather than where a wide receiver is standing. He throws those wide receivers open as well as any freshman I've ever seen. Uh, how much of it is based on which system they're going to with this new offense? Well, you know, we, we talk so much about system. The, the other part of it is, you know what good coaches do is they also adapt their system and, and select parts of their system based on what they have, right? And you right. modify and you, and you change. Cause it, it's, and when we talk about pro style, I, I think instantly everyone gets this idea in their head that you're, all right, you're under center and you're doing eye backs and you're, you know, you're just going to run Bo Scarborough downhill 30 times a game and it's a, occasionally you play action off of it. That's not necessarily the case. I mean, more pro styles running out of shotgun now and it's really more about, what are your what are your formations? What are your you know your passing routes and, and things like that? So it, there is an interesting dynamic to all of this in that even though this is Jalen Hurts' team, the fact that you have a, a new offensive coordinator coming in and there's a new kid coming in, he enrolled early, so he's you know he's got a little bit extra time. A lot of these kids now are doing that; they're enrolling early, so they have extra time to, to get prepared. Is there is I don't want to call it an open competition. That's that's not it. That's not what this is. But there is an aspect of all right, well, here's, here's what we have. What, what can you do? What can you not do? And, and you sort of test the waters a little bit with each of them. Well, and, and let me also add this to this. If you look at these two quarterbacks, because I think they are a little different style, what a nightmare it would be. I, I think when you talk about opposing defensive coordinators, if they read your article and, and if that really happens, which I think it will happen, I think there's defensive coordinators that are like, that's a nightmare to prepare for when you don't know when another guy's going to be coming in and he's a different style quarterback uh, when you look at that. I mean, it's a nightmare for de opposing defensive coordinators. It's a nightmare if they, if they both really go and, and play up to their potential. I mean, you can have two quarterbacks and it's a total just mess and things are, are you know, flying around and, and it's not working at all and there's no chemistry and, and, it, and to a degree, then it becomes very predictable. So just because you, you have on paper two talented quarterbacks doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work out. But if you have Tua come in and there's a, there's a set of things designed for him, that just makes it very hard to defend that if, from a defensive personnel standpoint. 
you don't have the guys to defend what they have on the field or they start going tempo. And, you know, again, the thing with tempo is defensively, you can't change out that personnel. If you find something in the weakness in the defense and they're able to exploit it with something maybe other than what you were ready for, then, yeah, that's what makes it difficult. Now, defensive coordinators maybe down the line have a little bit of an edge because they then have the tape on it. But if you can – that's why I say it's such a hard balance to find. But if you can find that balance with a, you know, a one and a two option like this, I mean, that court – Alabama has never really been known for quarterbacks under Saban. And then suddenly that, that paradigm shifts completely. Well, Ben, is it fair? Is this a fair statement? Because we've watched Nick Saban handle five stars at running backs, and you can give guys on linebackers roles on special teams. But I'm calling this the biggest Nick Saban roster management he's ever had because he's never had two elite quarterbacks in the same backfield. When when you talk to me, you know, it's just one quarterback generally plays. Is this Nick Saban's biggest roster management? Yeah, it, absolutely. If, if if he really comes in as and, and starts showing what he can do, and he's got because again, you're not talking about a senior and a freshman, right? You're not you're not talking about guys who've got sure. to face apart. You're talking about a sophomore and a freshman, absolutely. On on a number of levels, absolutely it is. Yeah, and it, it's it's going to be unique to see how Nick Saban manages. Oh yeah, and by the way, I don't think this will influence it, uh, but Tua has got a younger brother that they're saying that is just as good, if not better in some areas at his age than he is. So I guess it would probably be wise to keep the Tua Tonga Valoa family pretty happy. I'm just saying, I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm just, I mean, because Nick Saban does a lot of things based on recruiting. He does a ton yeah. of things based on recruiting that, that may be a possibility because he may never have to worry about a quarterback if he manages this the right way. Well, you know, the other thing is, is, is you, the part about managing the quarterback situation is this is where you do have to be careful. You have to be careful with promises. And the case in point is a team that Alabama faces every year and a Texas A&M with Kyle Allen and Kyler Murray. That was mismanaged from the start because there were some promises of playing time and one of them was looking over their shoulder. And that was a whole freaking mess. That's what happens when you have two talented quarterbacks and it doesn't work out. Yeah, well, and and I think that's the that's the conversation. I don't think Nick Saban promised him playing time, but I do yeah. think that that he told him that he could compete for the job because I don't think a kid like Tua Tonga Bailoa comes to Alabama unless he he really believes that he can compete for the job and well, you uh, have, everything. You have to, yeah, you have to believe that you can compete, and you need to want to compete. This is Nick Saban was the guy who went to Julio Jones, who maybe right now is the best wide receiver in the NFL and said, we don't need you. <laughs> so Nick, you know, Nick Saban is not the guy who's going to tell you, oh, yeah, you're going to come in and you're, you're going to be a star for us. If you're going to be along four- and five-star guys at every position, and you've got you've to gotta beat them, and you have to be the best. And that, but that's why you have the culture in Alabama that works, is because all of those guys come in and they, they want that competition. You know, there's the, there's the old story about, I think it was Woody Hayes, it might have been Bo Schembecker, it was, it was, I think it was Hayes, who they would go into a five-star, what would have been a five-star recruit living room, and he said, all right, you know, we want you to come to Ohio State, and the kid would say, well, I could go and be fourth on your depth chart, or I could go to Purdue and start, maybe I should do that. And their response was, yeah, maybe you should, because they knew right then and there you didn't want any part of that of that competition. Well, Ben, it's it's a great article when you look at it uh, from the, the bold predictions. We do a show in August where we, we have callers call up, and we record the show, and then we play it during the month of December to see how many of us have, have come true. So we're going to get you back on and salute you if, if some of this comes true. Let me hit one other point to tie this to Alabama. Your first bold prediction, the Heisman Trophy, will be awarded to a true freshman for the first time, and you're going to Florida State's running back, true freshman, sensational player there, Cam Akers, and Alabama will see him in 79 days. Well, you know what's interesting about that is I, is I, I think for as much as I like Cam Akers, I, that – Week one matchup I don't, is not good for him, I don't think. Now, because Florida State's been a better run blocking team than a pass blocking team, uh, and they're breaking in kind of a new offensive line this year. And I think you go up against Alabama's defensive front, that that could be very problematic for for Florida State. But uh, unless your name's Lamar Jackson, the Heisman's not one in September; it's one in November. And I think if you're Florida State, 
which projects to be in the national conversation, uh, caters to his skills offensively from, from what they do from a play calling standpoint. Uh, I think this team has the ability to get sh- stronger as the year goes on. So uh, Akers, if he's everything talent-wise that, that we have been led to believe, I think he's in the right situation to foster that type of high threat. Let me hit one more, and I said I was going to hit one, and then I was going to be done. Let me let me hit your five power five coaches that will not make it to November. You've got Kevin Sumlin, Hugh Freeze, Brian Kelly at Notre Dame, Todd Graham at Arizona State, Jim Moore at UCLA, and Butch Jones at Tennessee. It's a big conversation that we've got here. Uh, could that number even be more than, than five? Well, I said I said at least five. I'd probably go maybe a little bit above that if. Just, I mean, November and December is still firing season. You're, you're only now, over the past few years, really starting to slink past that. But you got to remember, I think there was only like one, maybe two Power 5 coaches that lost their job in September. So I, I think right the reason why I'm going with five this year by the end of October is that I think the conditions are right for it. I think buyouts are uh, – the schools are are able to get the buyouts now. There was a lot of guys like Summon last year. They just they couldn't afford the buyout, even if they wanted to let him go. So I think some of that factors into it. Some of it is just who's available in the market. Um, I think Chip Kelly is going to continue to be a hot name for college football. So it, some of it depends on who's available, how much they'd have to pay. I think the conditions are a little bit more right this year for more action to be taken earlier in the season. So. I said at least five. I'll, I'll stick with five, maybe six. 